Hello, and welcome to the Think Bunker series, Bunker Briefs, a series where we go into different topics, as you can see here, U.S. service elements, and just discuss amongst the four members of the square table. Starting us off, my name is Painful. I am the CEO or the founder of Think Bunker. Next to me is my co-host, Kento. I am here. And then we have Angered Sideburns who is our editor, well, more so our recorder, and then we have T4, our editor. Hello, Alice. Good Is everyone doing all right today? Good morning, good morning. He's speaking in a language I cannot understand. Oh, no, he's speaking Nazi. Take him no. out, take him out. Zika. It's um, uh, 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 off into US service elements. Yeah, yeah, yes. we're, yeah, we're talking about helmets. U.S. Well, service helmets. So, uh, now, before we begin, uh, there were 12 of, 12 of you subscribed. That's assuming that the people who subscribed came back to watch our videos. And we yeah. cannot express our thanks for that. 12 of you decided to give us a subscribe. Thank you. We cannot thank you enough. And also the views on the, on the last video, uh, which was kind of rushed in his editing, not going to lie, but... For our first video, it did really well. And if you are a returning viewer from that video, thank you. If you are a first time viewer, we're going to go down some rabbit holes. So, anyway. Buckle up. Also, I have suffering from a bit, wait, bit of a. Where the wascally rabbit? <clears throat> ah. But uh, I am suffering from a bit of a cold. You could say cold, it, mostly allergies. So, uh, mostly a slight hint of death. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so if I am a, if if you hear me coughing or sneezing or I choke up while talking, I apologize. So let's get into it. U.S. service helmets. Now, many first-time viewers, not just of the cha of this channel, but more so history in general, will think this is the first U.S. service helmet. But in actuality, it is not. This would be it. Um. Uh. uh... My brain just died. Okay, but that's fine. Uh, no, it's not. Are very Dragoons are very interesting. Um, between all, all of everyone here, I th think that I have looked at them the most. Do, do either, any of y'all, like, what are you, what do y'all know about Dragoons? Well, um, from well, before somebody... I... Before I go on a little tangent here, um, I'll keep things short. They were for light infantry, mount, light mounted infantry, back in um, the good old days. Um, they were not to stop bullets, but necessarily, but to reflect um, mostly saber strikes, actually, from cavalry swords and like that. That so is one of the reasons that goes over the top of the helmet. And also, I believe that it was. It originated mostly in France, um, used as a as the dragoon helmet, and it has the you know the crest on the top and whatnot. It's one way to distinguish it, which would actually make sense as the French, as America got a lot of its military doctrine starting off in the 1770s from France, who was who were training the colonial army. But also, Correct. from my understanding of dragoons, uh, they have different meanings in different countries however my, they're meant to be used as multi-purpose infantry if you will they could commit they could work as cavalry but also work can dismount and do footwork as regular infantry if they need to now, you, 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 but you probably wouldn't want to <clears throat> use your dragoons like that because these are your cavalry men they're trained at least on horseback, so you probably don't want to waste them just like stand adding them to the end of your line yeah. of battle, where it's like on this flank we have the militia and our really expensive cavalry. Why, why do you have them there? Don't worry about it, it'll be fine. Right, but you, I, what it's I'm a saying secret is, tool that'll help us later. <laughs> oh, <it's>, um, <laughs> what I'm saying is that they could be used as infantry if they needed to be, but yes. preferably not. Yeah. The um, if you look at the uh, the nice, really, really nice art, I found that uh, I love I love old art, like watercolored art like that. Uh, you can notice that he's got the um, 
the the bang rod on his hip. Oh uh, yeah. The car- uh, carbine of some sort, or some kind of pistol, or rifle. You could probably just use a standard rifle. Uh, probably would not hit much of anything, but uh, it's better than nothing. Uh, the uh, the helmet also does a really nice, neat thing of since you're on a moving animal and the animals tend to sometimes fall over and y- you are now airborne and rapidly approaching the ground, it also does a nice job of protecting your cranium from the hard rock on the ground that is rapidly approaching your uh, skull. <laughs> Yeah, I understand. Or, are you rap- or is your skull rapidly approaching the rock? Um, you know, it, it just depends on the perspective. You know, yeah. the rock I'm is the rock you fly towards it, and then you're flying towards the rock. It's like a match made in heaven. <laughs> a but very I'm, abusive I'm, relationship. That's uh, perfect. That's, uh, perfect. that's what I want. On to, on to more history. The design for the Dragoon helmet was based on ancient Roman and Greek style helmets, if you look at it, because of of the large crest and whatnot. Some of them using not tassels, but you know, hair from animals and whatnot, and a lot of them just having a, a cone that goes down top the crest. Yes. Yeah. It, it honestly uh, kind of reminds me of those uh those Roman I'm trying to think of it. It's the one that with the the large feather piece in the middle, those Roman uh that Roman helmet. Yeah. Oh, are you talking? Oh, you're talking about the like the very famous one with the yeah. broom yeah, broomstick. The, the, yeah. yeah. Yep. That one. Uh, not the because uh, there were a lot of Roman and like Spartan helmets that had the the uh the the frill was not like a mohawk. It was like a just uh, going laterally, yes. from shoulder to shoulder. Um, so, which is kind of infuriating when you're trying to look up one type particular type of helmet and the only thing you just see is the other one yeah it's rather unfortunate uh this helmet was not especially from the american standpoint and also being maximum poor uh the uh this thing well, is they had, they had rice they they did have rice they uh also had uh tobacco and um they had uh, they had a lot of natural resources like furs and whatnot. Uh, there's just this unfortunate thing called a navy that's staring them down and all of their trading <laughs> ships. It's just like yeah, we we have all of this goods. We would love to sell it to. And then there's like a a fifth rate ship of the line sitting outside the harbor with like sixty guns pointing at them. You know what? I don't think I want to go out to sea today. I'm feeling a little bit under the weather. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's ammonia. I'm yeah, it's, a, it's like, hey, France wants a bunch of these furs. Let's go ahead and sell it to... Man, that storm oh. is pretty rough. Um, oh, dang it, I think I got scurvy again. Uh, sir, yeah, what, do you mean, what do you mean that storm is rough? It's literally clear skies and calm water. Well, uh, fortunately for them, the ship is called the storm. Uh. No, no, my arm is also messing up. I, I don't think I could give orders and all the... That hand, that cancer, like ah, I just broke my leg. And we all just <laughs> fell down the same set of stairs. So, if I'm understanding this right, the dragoon helmet, this one specifically, was made out of mostly leather. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. If you look at the uh, the one on the top right, that is the the big bands. Those are not leather. Those are the metal. Right, so it's a metal frame that houses the leather filling. I'm, um, I was, I was apprehensive to say this uh, originally. I didn't know if those were metal or not. I'm assuming so. But if you look at the hooks that go down the side, you know the crests usually are used for deflecting sabers or other sort of weapons that would crush your skull or you know, cleave your. It, it wouldn't be good. Uh, and the hooks on the side keep it from going all the way down to your ears. Mm-hmm. It just it it covers more of the way. Also, it might help with your shoulder if they're swinging down. It slides in front of you more than if it were to have nothing on the side, like in the second. It's basically a hand guard for your head. Yes, yes. indeed. Also, the bill the bill on the front of the this actually reminds me of an armored baseball cap. 
Uh, <laughs> but the, honestly, it really is. Oh my goodness! What are you about um, but the bill on the front there was for two things specifically. Um, well, they were too good in two situations. First would be like kind of acting as a sun visor. Cavalry. It was very important that cavalry cavalry could see what they were getting ready to charge into, and while riding into battle could determine whether uh, I might not face down that line of British infantry that just saw me. No, so, no, when you're moving 30 miles an hour on a horse, you know, charging on uneven ground, I don't want to see the ground. In fact, I'm just going to believe in the horse. Like all those <laughs> movies tell me where they just, like, they're not looking where the horse rider isn't looking, and they've got their hands stuck up in the air, and the wind is blowing their hair everywhere. And as the oh, branch is goodness. rapidly approaching them, and it knocks them off of the horse, and now they've broken their leg, and they down and get it amputated. And so, uh, uh, so while charging in, you know, imagine it's the evening time, and you're facing the uh, the west, and the the bill could act as a sun visor, so you could look down and be able to see what you're charging at if you're facing the sun. Another thing is saber strength, if you we're in the unfortunate situation of resorting to melee, which I don't think would happen often. And someone took a saber strike swing down towards you. You could, your that bill could kind of help protect you against a saber strike. Although I wouldn't imagine it's because I believe the bill is made out of leather, if I'm not mistaken. So I don't think it would help all that much. But hard and leather could at least cushion partly if they didn't. If their edge wasn't on. Perfectly, it would yeah. probably help Bounce vastly. And just like other than just Boring. your face, yeah, that too. Uh, or the uh, if it's a sound, it would probably make a gut wrenching sound of "Oh my gosh, I just almost had my face removed." Oh well, well, do, part, do, yeah, do, I mean, do, 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 do. yeah, that's um, uh, <laughs> hard and leather. And if you imagine, uh, if you look at the image on the top right and slicing down from the straight to the forehead. You have the bill, and then you have the metal braces, and then hardened leather on top of that. Even if they just hit the bill itself, hardened leather can, I, I'd imagine, could still stop the blade. Well, the hardened leather, uh, it might, hardened leather might be a little bit worse than just having it soft. If it's soft, it's absorbing a lot more of the impact. And well, it can also or, depends because the software, if their edge is on, there's a much higher chance of it going through or slicing through, especially with slicing weapons. If, if it's more more blunt, not as sharp, it would help more. Um, now, stab wounds, they, you don't really have much help here. Yeah, yeah, you, you're kinda, just, yeah, just, yeah if it's a lance, you're kind of done. Much, yeah, yeah. That's why I would say bayonets, it wouldn't be good against bayonets in this situation because they're not exactly slicing downwards. No, you, the hmm. big problem is your legs now, and, and, the, and the horse has now got a bunch of spears pointed at it. Uh, also function as point blank the leaders. Yeah. Oh no, my finger slipped and I hit the bang button. It's <laughs> more than <laughs> if more than anything the bill serves as like a is a a sun visor. Yeah. Yeah. Also like a little fashion thing. You could probably use wood. Um, um it probably would not uh, especially for America would not be any sort of like metal sheet. But some kind of wood insert or just layered leather. Um, so probably like three layers just uh, sewn together around the outside. So that it's stiff enough to like hold its place, but it's not so thick that it starts uh, so thin that it starts flopping around. And it looks unprofessional. Yeah. Yeah, because because now, it, in the um in, in the seventeen like seventies and eighties, it's like, what's more important, having uh, our soldiers dripped out or <laughs> functionality? The answer is always drip. All of the above. Yeah, yeah, it's it's just drip. It, like some of these the soldiers that were walking around at this time, they they were basically glorified Christmas trees. <laughs> I love like, that. Some of these, some oh of these my people, goodness! If the sun bounced off of them wrong, it would just blind the enemy. Yeah. I, I love that thing where people like say that. that oh, the British had uh, red uniforms to 
to make it to where if they got shot, the blood would mix into the coat and they wouldn't be able to tell that they were shot for morale. I go, that's bullcrap. They're on the ground. Uh, here's the thing. It's, it's the, the, the point. I, first of all, these, these fellas over these, uh, these fellas in the background here, you wouldn't be able to tell if they're bleeding if you shot them even from this distance. Yeah. And then on top of that, you know what tells you that you shot someone? Oh, I don't know. You know, it's not shot someone with a point six nine bullet, a, a point six nine ball knife. You know what would tell you that you shot them? The fact that they're rolling around on the ground. Yeah. So the, like, the one of the and running away. Yeah. Well, well, one one of the things about the, the musket balls is they did a lot of carnage. So you think when we think about like calibers, one I think about like the nine millimeter. It, it it will penetrate and it, it oftentimes it doesn't fully put somebody down. You know, forty five ACP that normally yeah. does the for the musket ball. It, it it's it's quite a bit more. It packs a little bit more of a punch. But what it does is it spreads out so bad, like to the size of a quarter and more of you know just its width, and it tears a big old hole through you. So it's more like getting hit by uh, one inch projectile to two inch projectile. Well, yeah, people, that, if people think that the uh, 50 cal is a big bullet, they ain't got nothing on this thing. <laughs> well, well, the, the problem with powerful. these is sometimes of just how these bullets were made, they could break apart basically on contact and just spread out everywhere. You're never getting the metal out of the person. Mm -hmm. It's just going into all of that the was, organs. I believe or, that was mostly the mini ball. Because of yeah. you know, it's shaped, it was actually shaped like a bullet. So it, it's the difference between muskets and rifles because rifles use any ball one up. So the muskets, normal muskets, they you know with the big old lead ball, those normally flattened out relatively nicely. Mini ball broke apart. Very a, a problem. Sometimes. If and I'm not mistaken, mini ball it's yeah, hollow down. Well, well, when these things are around, they're using mini ball. They're, they're using um, mini balls for. Not the okay. uh, not like the the like bullets. Bullets weren't around at all. They had like eighteen. 40s. I want to say the eighteen fifties. Yeah, I say, I want to say the eighteen fifties or so, early fifties at the. Because they were used in the um eighteen sixties in the American Civil War, uh, quite uh a lot. Um, yes, is that an understatement. They were used almost exclusively. Um, a mini ball, depending on you know how you make it. It can do pretty much anything in a body. Um, cases of them just bouncing off of bones, creating a spalling inside of a person, which is a terrible thought. Like, uh, we always think of spalling inside of a tank, but have you ever seen a human spall? Bringing it back into the helmets, though, is that these would not protect you from that sort of damage. Well, a helmet uh, never uh, was uh, supposed in, to. Well, yeah. This, it, of course, is not intended to. They didn't really have the bullet stopping technology by this point. It's much later on that we get around to something like that. But I, I would say if you got really lucky and the round hit one of the metal bands around at a very far angle that probably would have killed you before, it might not kill you this way. Oh, you want to suffer a concussion. Uh, you're you're <laughs> not going to be having a good day. Um, yeah, so you're it, alive. Not designed for that. It's designed to stop sabers and such. And one thing people have a misunderstanding, not just in this helmet, but because, uh, well, not a lot of the people know this helmet exists, uh, at least mainstream anyways, but a lot of people assume that helmets are bulletproof. I don't know why, but they do. Well, I mean, it's a large, it's a large metal bucket that goes in your head. Yeah. It, it's That's what people traditionally think of helmets. Helmet. All right, so is there anything more about the Dragoon helmet before we move on? Um, uh, would like to uh, put in a quick thing. Um, America did not have a lot of Dragoons. These are and in use with America. They are effectively just skirmish cavalry. They are right up on the enemy, can't take a couple of pop shots, and leave. Um, uh, I'm in danger. Oh, no, that's danger. Well, we're running away now. Uh, sort of like... Uh, Monty Python, run away! Run away! <laughs> yes, exactly like that. Um, it's kind of like the Patriot, where it's just hit-and-run tactics. 
Um, but uh, one notable uh, unit would be uh, Colonel Bland's first Virginia Ors of the Continental Line. They got some drip. They are indeed dripped out. Uh, not a, uh, if I remember correctly, it was not like an amazing uh, retinue of uh, service. However, there wasn't a whole lot of that in the American Army to be had. Uh, a lot of America's battles were like just random hordes of farmers, like maybe 50 of them armed to the teeth, just shooting and yeah. stuff. But All right. an incredibly interesting helmet. It's our first helmet, and we love things that are first. So, uh, we are we all okay with moving on now? I think we're okay. I have we're nothing good. left there... to say. Nothing else all left right. to say? It's good. I think everything's been pretty well covered here. Yeah? Yep. All right, next is the rest of the... Wait, we didn't, rest we of didn't ask IT what his feelings were. No, that's hey, Gerald. George. And... Oh, Gerald. Uh, Gerald is... Oh, no, it's... Uh, Gerald, George, whoever we just give him a J name, and it doesn't matter. James, I don't J. Care. Uh, yeah, George I, I doesn't is start with a J. So Jeremy, he, he doesn't have a mic. Yeah, Jeremy is like Kenny from South Park. He's just so extremely poor. <laughs> hey, I was poor, Jeremy. Anyways, so on to the rest of the helmets. Yes. Can we go to the American Model uh, 1880 Sun Helmet? This is assuming that anyone watching this is just playing games with this in the background, but that also assumes that anyone's watching our video. So that's a yeah. Powerful. Don't get your hopes too high, mate. Yeah, they're not high at all. <clears throat> uh, Wait, so you guys have hopes? I, I gathered the photos for this this glorious diorama that you see before you my massive editing skills um it's not, and you're going to notice literally made a powerpoint yeah <sighs> I, I made a powerpoint bask in my glory um, you know the worst part is uh that's actually true this is just straight up a powerpoint and i love it yeah it's amazing. see see that's like me that's it's the you, you have to think outside the box for memes and, and this is this is mine this is how to meme with PowerPoint. <laughs> um, um, I think we. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to kick these off from its origin, like a dumb failed one. So it originated from the Spanish military, and eventually it was adopted by, I believe, the British and possibly the France, French, and then um, the U.S. adopted it in, oh, yes, well, the French. The, the French. Yes. And, um, let's see, I, it's made out of pith, as, as the name implies. What exactly is pith? So it's a fibrous material. I am i don't remember exactly where it comes from. Uh, it, it's I believe it's the core of certain plants and whatnot. And it was basically made of fiber. So that that's the like original definition. That's like um, what a real pith helmet would be. But... A lot of them were made out of any sort of fibrous material you can get. So this wasn't even made out of leather. It was made by so like they, they they took they weaved bamboo as well into the correct shape. So it was just fiber fibrous, overlaid with canvas and sometimes inlaid with metal. You can see like the metal spike on the top of the the picture in the top right, which is I believe to deflect some sort of saber of some sort. Uh, yes, that is the that's uh, an interesting thing to talk about about the uh, mystery of the pickle halba. Uh, uh, the pickle halba. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> good helmet. So a I lot love, of people, a lot of um, uh, you may now someone may ask. Uh, there's a massive time gap in between the Dragoon helmet and then the service the, this fifth helmet and someone may ask well what happened Did they just use the Dragoon helmet uh, and if anyone doesn't know history no they just use caps like literally wool and cotton caps if you've seen any just look up Union Union Confederate they both had pretty much the same uniform that was just dyed a different color or very similar at the least and they use cloth, just cloth caps. Now you could say that the dragoon helmet is a cloth, is is just a service cap. 
I, I still say no because it was purpose designed to protect your head against something. The reason why regular infantry weren't really given helmets was because, you know, you fall down, you fall down. It was physically rare to die from hitting your head on something. However, uh, you know, helmets are meant to protect. And so a lot of cavalry just didn't, or infantry didn't have helmets. Yeah, because you're not protecting much with a helmet from, you know, 18, <coughs> um, 18, uh, 1800s and 1700s. You're not protecting against much. Um, a, like, a helmet is expensive for an army. You're asking to put a lot of money into these helmets, and they are, aren't protecting for much. The area of protection is not even your face, which is where you're going to get shot in because you're going to be facing your enemy. So, oh, um, I think we failed to mention its um, real main purpose. If you would note the name Sun Helmet, would anyone like to expound upon that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can jump uh, jump on that. So the idea of the Sun Helmet was you want if you did have a soldier who wanted some type of head protection, uh, you, your options are quite limited. It's either a hat or a helmet. Or, you know, your hair. And helmets and certain hats and these environments get very, very hot and uncomfortable to wear. However, these pith, these pith helmets were very thermodynamically... They were better transferring heat away from your head, keeping you nice and uh, cool. In a lot of these tropical environments where... A lot of these colonial forces from in, uh, Europe and America are fighting. Uh, one of them being the um, Spanish-American War, where you see the uh, Rough Riders uh, charging yeah. uh, up the uh, hill. And the matter oh, of that you, see, you see that none of them have a helmet, but why I included is it was a conflict at that time that America was involved in. Um, around this time with helmets like these apparently they did have them around no one just no one took any pictures of them or okay. draw drew anyone with them on they'd rather just give them like cowboy hats Which, um or you have something that you're going to say oh uh, no i'm i don't have anything at the moment i don't actually know too much about these helmets so i'm kind of i'm listening i sure. Um, uh, one thing I was going to say is another big purpose for the sun helmet was to protect from rain as well. They treated, not true, but they coated the wood or the fibers with a lot of um, tar and whatnot to, of course, protect from the rain. And then they had the canvas and whatnot, but it, it, it just helped a lot when it comes to moisture and whatnot on your head constantly. I mean, with hats, they'll get soaked all the way through with this helmet. It's not as problematic. What, what it's dry. I, 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 one thing I couldn't find is, is it does what it, since it's also a good at uh, keeping water away. How is its ability to dry out? I, I, I was I'm, assuming that it would be better than like a normal hat. Yeah. Well, I, I would only imagine that you know the outside material, just some sort of cloth of some sort. I, it just takes it just takes time for that to dry. I imagine. Other than that, there's not much more. Um, there's nothing else that really absorbs water well with the helmet and its construction. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, talking about some of these photos a little bit more. The um, the man, uh, the two men in the center, and the one on uh, center right. Uh, those are Marines. They're not using the same type of pith helmet that is on the right-hand side, but they, it is a pith-styled helmet. Those are U.S. Marines there. Uh, there were a couple of different variations of this helmet. Uh, some were even converted into police helmets. Uh, if anyone has uh, watched Victorian-era like police uh shows where they have the uh, constable wearing something that looks 
a lot like this in navy blue. Uh, the, if I remember correctly, the New York Police Department uh, used these uh, for their police officers at some point. And I, I've, I've forgotten until recent, like how much um, the, the pit bomb has been displayed in media in general, or how it's been um, how it's been used a lot. And say in a lot of shows, like um, for for Britain and whatnot, different things from that time for, um, when they were to take place in that time, recording whatnot. A lot of them have these helmets. I don't even see like any. Everyone's probably seen a movie where there's an explorer going through the woods. They've got a helmet on. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, it just it, it, it's it's been relatively widely um, used in media, unlike something like the dragoon helmet. Uh, one uh, really good movie uh, I always recommend um, is Zulu, uh, where a lot of these are used. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a really good movie, the acting, and it's really nice. Uh, I forget the name of the battle, but it's about the uh, British Zulu War at around the same time period uh, of the 18... Late eighteen hundreds. Um, this helmet is uh, I, I guess to, just uh, I guess we'll finish up on protection for this helmet. It is not much. This thing may stop a single blow from a some kind of saber slash sword a spear to the head, maybe. But yeah, so this, do like... is, this this thing is, and that's only with the metal bands. Yeah, and and then on top of that, the spike on top of the on top of the helmet. I've seen people discuss this, and some theorize that it's it's oh look, the soldiers are so uh, elite that they don't sit down on their helmets, or that you could use it as an improvised melee weapon. Which I mean, theoretically, I that no, it's mainly that. Sabers, bayonets, you stab like spears, but with sabers, you you do a lot of slashing, and one of those slashes came down because one way of taking someone out of a fight is a direct strike to the cranium. So when doing that, the the spike on top of the helmet, as seen in the top right image, could help deflect that ever so slightly, slightly to where it deflects it off the top instead of slicing the helmet in half. It'll move it to the side and then uh, have it strike one of the metal bands on the side or of the helmet. Completely deflect it or knock mm -hmm. the blade um, angle to the point where a cut is ineffective. Yes. So, um, helmet... yeah, just... Go ahead. Continue. Oh, you're good. No, I, I insist. Okay. Edge, edge so, alignment um... is important. Yeah, but because, like, the material that's made of... Um... That material can be hardened, and so it's how they form it. It is actually relatively sturdy when it comes to, well, I don't say like a slash, slashing, but I have a decent chance of helping with that because of the kink on the outside and whatnot as well. But it would not offer this amount of protection as if you, you would to had hardened leather or something similar. Yeah. So uh, or, or these helmets metal. were more like a mother putting a band aid on a child's little cut. It makes you feel better if you're wearing it. It doesn't actually do much against a lot. And, you know, sometimes it might help. It's like dirt getting in your cut. It might deflect a little bit of that, but eventually it's going to get in one day. So these helmets are more of a, a feel-good solution instead of a protection. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, it, it, yeah. it also can be used it outside of its intended purpose, which would be... For protecting you against the sun. Yes. yes. Much like much like the dirt getting into the child's wounds is much like the IRS invading my house. What? Ah. Uh, uh, that's a, that's another. Uh, tropical environments are horrendous for troop movement. A lot of people think of like uh, Mother Winter. Uh, the tropics uh, are terrible. Places like the tropics, Cuba, the, Cuba uh, the jungles. Uh, 
uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, these places are in absolute like swamps. And you without some experience and in Southeast over... Asia, just die. Mm -hmm. A particular uh, war in the mm -hmm. 60s, anyways. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the uh, um, so heat stroke is a very real possibility uh, and is rampant. And losing soldiers to heat and uh, exhaustion and dehydration is something you would rather avoid. You'd rather avoid the attrition of these environments. And this was a solution. Um, a lot of the times it was uh, really light help hats um, or just going hatless or and just like basic sun protection was good at getting the sun off of you, putting a little bit of shade on you, but some of them are uncomfortable and this was the solution. Uh, I, I guess on the final point of protection, so it's not great at melee, it's not great, but not terribly bad at melee protection. It's really nice for combating the elements, but against firearms, this is an absolute no-no. Uh, pistols are probably still going to go in this thing quite easily. Yes. Uh, rifles are 100% going in one side and out the other. Your skull will cease to exist. These aren't the Marines that we know now where they eat crayons and their favorite color is rainbow. I actually want, unironically, a, a standard issue pack of, of Marine Corps crayons just to see what all the hype is. Good stuff. It's good but stuff. All in all, this helmet here is certainly a helmet of all time. Yes, it's a very iconic helmet. Uh, very <clears throat> unique and an interesting solution. It has it's a, a it's a, it has a surprisingly loyal or the style I'd say the style more so than this than the specific eighteen eighty helmet. It has a pretty decent following for not being a very mainstream helmet. How I, is the it, helmet fandom doing? Not too not too I great recently while, actually. Yeah. Not too great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it died. Not died, but I think it kind of tapered down around the early two thousands. Fell off in nineteen fall. Mm. Ah. The the he everyone the, the, the pith helmet fandom is dying. We need your support. <laughs> <laughs> these are these are the members of the pith helmet community. The, the this list is incomplete. You can help by expanding it. <laughs> <laughs> The uh the only thing keeping that pith helmet uh outside of stuff like uh, the iconic police officer, a lot of colonial Victorian era stuff, it is literally just the pickle helmet. It is the only thing keeping this thing like on the table. And the pickle hel the pickle helmet, uh f for those we're, we're saying this and we don't have a single reference. I don't think we've explained what that is. It is a German pith helmet that was used in World War One that has a spike on it that everyone simultaneously likes but doesn't know what it does. So funny because it was like for for that helmet specifically at the time period in which it was, um, it was in service at a time in which most people did not have a helmet in service. Most people at that point they did not have a helmet at all, and. For some odd, terrible reason, the Germans just had it. Well, uh, see, yeah, well, every they, time they, I see they... this helmet, right, I think I, for some reason, every time I see the pickle helmet, I'm reminded of a certain comedy movie. And it is like really low budget. It's a really old movie. And it's about this these people going across the country in their own little flying machines or whatever. And there's this one German dude who's in this race, and he flies a little hot air balloon. And there's this one scene in the movie where he stands up and his pickle how his pickle how the pokes a hole in the hot air balloon and he crashes. And it's like the funniest thing as a kid. And so every time I see the pickle how but I think of this German dude picking up from a hot air balloon and just falling flat. 
You know, the worst part is, as soon as you said hot air balloon, I knew exactly where that joke was going. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I, I think I know the thing. I uh, it's a really that, old, that, low budget. That, movie. that that would absolutely be in a Hanna Barbera cartoon. It was no, so I, funny. I think there was a Han- that could, There was like a, a, a it was like a race around the world. Yes, like all these su- scientists. Uh huh. Okay, and it's not the one where it's around the world in eighty days or ninety days. It's not that movie. It's a different one. It's like people that... from all different countries, like like racing yeah. in their homemade planes or whatever. <laughs> the, uh, it was the funniest got... movie as a kid. Uh... So, anyways, um, the pip helmet overall was a great design. However, as you'll see, helmet development and the American helm, funnily enough, uh, you could call us uh, freedom booze, but I'd say otherwise. Um, we actually have sources on why America's the best. We'll get into that. Don't worry about I that. I made them up. Don't worry. But, uh, you're, you are putting words into my mouth, sir, and I don't like it. <laughs> I'm, putting, yeah, I'm not going to say that. I personally think that Luxembourg is the best country. Uh, listen, my favorite country Guys, is Zimbabwe. Transnistria. <laughs> so, anyways, my favorite country um, is Antarctica. As yeah, the awesome. helmets were, would develop, they were... Uh, they would be made to counteract different things as war changed and the battlefield battlefield changed. Before, does anyone else have anything else to say on the sun helmet? Nothing to add. No. Oh. Um, one thing I, I want to, as I as I was alluding to with how the war technology progresses, the M nineteen seventy exists in helmets much like it: the Adrian, the Star Helm, the Brody helmet. Exist because of shrapnel. When world when cannons went from uh, just solid lead balls and sometimes uh, high explosive balls, and they turned more into artillery shells, being able to specifically design to throw shrapnel even farther. Your uh, your mesh fab your your mesh you could say fibrous helmet wasn't exactly that could barely stop a poke from a, a a bayonet, uh, a bayonet or a uh, sword became a bit obsolete whenever shrapnel started existing much uh, in, in the First World War. It, it's not exactly fun to lose a lot of soldiers when an artillery shell that strikes about a couple couple yards away from them that wouldn't kill them if they had a metal helmet but just careened through the skull because they had a helmet that was made out of, well, fiber. Yeah, yeah. minor. Mm-hmm. Uh, a slight mind. unconscious moment. They all um, sleep. It'll be up in a few minutes. Uh, uh, it's, it's not fun to lose that many infantry. Yeah. Before we get too far, that. I'm going to start with a little bit of a little, little history on it. So it was, uh, yeah, I used my sources here. It was, uh, Patented in London in 1915 by John Leopold Brody. So, um, I wonder where the Brody gets his name thing. from. Yes, mm. so uh, it's a very funny thing. To, so, one of, one of the things about it is that it, um, I'm sure everyone could talk about this specific topic. So, the Brody helmet, it it pertains to one of the two versions of the helmet, pretty much very similar. So I don't remember if the Brody Helm pertains specifically to the 1915 variant of it, or if it pertains to the U.S. 1917 version. Oh, okay, um, I, I've got that. Please clear that up for me, please. Okay, so the um, America doesn't get involved into the war until uh, 1917. We're we're not we're not involved. Uh, 1917, we're now involved. Um, in 1915. Uh, the nation of Great Britain and France start noticing, oh no, casualties are amassing due to artillery shrapnel, and we're losing an unreasonable amount of men. Some of them out uh, killed and others just wounded very badly, because damage to the head is usually very bad. Uh, yeah. why, does, why does small bits of high-velocity metal just start killing your soldiers? Mm, that sucks. Uh, but 
they took a look at this and this was the quick fix it was a very good quick fix this was and this is not to stop uh this is to stop airburst rounds this is to stop uh shrapnel that is blowing up in no man's land or just around the trenches and getting into the trenches. This is not meant to stop a direct mortar strike on someone's head. I'm sorry, right. but if you get like sniped with a mortar, you're dead. Oh no, or no, the helmet will bounce it off. So you'll be the, fine. It simply ricochets average <laughs> war thunder logic. If it's, you're, if it's you're Russian, a big yeah, king, if, if weapon if, has if, been destroyed. But you're if fine. Russian helmet mortar fails to go off, helmet cracks in half, and then and then. Russian soldier transport baby cross border. That baby Starlin himself. <laughs> uh, the um, the uh, the British <clears throat> Mark One helmet, which was the nineteen fifteen uh, variant. Uh, it's exact, pretty much exactly the same as the M nineteen seventeen. However, America, while we did use some British Mark Ones. America wanted their own helmet. They just wanted you know, to be, be special. They wanted, and yeah. America did have a program uh, during the war and a little bit afterwards on, you know, making America the American helmet. Didn't go making well. America great again. Uh, Amer <laughs> the, the program didn't go well. Uh, the, there were rampant complaints between the developers and the Department of. It looks too much like this one. It looks too much like this one. No, it doesn't comfortable. It falls off. This is literally just a face mask. <laughs> it, it, they went through, I think, like 13 different variants uh, while they were using this, and they were like, no, just stop. Just stop. We, we, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll find a better design. We'll go with that. But until then, we're using the M1917. Uh, the yeah, and also... Is what, if you put them side by side, no one can pick really pick out the differences. But there are some changes to the coding, uh, some of the rivets that are used, where stuff is placed, like minor aesthetic changes for the M nineteen seventeen from the Mark One, uh, and it would and... have a really oh, okay, but. Yeah, they're basically the same thing. Yeah, I think a lot of the changes that were made to the M nineteen seventeen was just for local American production. Yeah, th yeah, that and you know a little bit of American pride of yeah, we built our own helmets. We didn't put an extra rivet. It's America now. Well, put an Amer made an American label on it right next to it, like <laughs> a really big American eagle right next to yes. the American flag. And so. Uh, yeah, and why do a lot of research into if you can make a different helmet? Uh, great. However, why do all that research and try to make a new helmet and try to rush one into design, into production that you know people don't like when the British already did the research for us and have a pretty decent serv a serviceable helmet? Yeah, a, a really a, a yeah a decent helmet in general, a helmet that in, you know fulfills its purpose. No real need. No real need to go out of your way. Another thing this helmet may be good at is, uh, apart from stopping shrapnel, is if you know medieval history, this helmet would remind you of a certain uh, medieval helmet. <clears throat> the medieval would you like to chime in, Z4? Absolutely. So let's take a trip back on down to the 13th century. Okay, so I need to get some coffee. <laughs> okay, yeah, I've got my water right here. I'm preparing for my trip. Miss Frizzle, take us. Uh, We're going on a trip to, to our favorite rocket ship. Time to climb into the magic treehouse. <laughs> yes. okay. Imagine, if you will, a place of castles, of no. knights, of lords, of ladies, of swords, of torch. Anyway. Not sponsored by established titles. <laughs> Back in the day of swords and bows and crossbows there was a certain helmet in the 13th century called drum roll please the kettle helm this helmet was mainly used by archers but a lot of people don't know but that wasn't exclusively made for archers but rather was used for mostly the um the poorer of the foot soldiers the knights you know they had all their extravagant 
uh, at the time, the barrel helm, and then you have the, the hog nose helm later on. Those are all those are all pretty cool. But the kettle Did they helm, use the great helm at this time. The great helm is just like it's just starting to. It's in the second phase, so it's going from the flat top to the rounded top now. Okay. The but helmet. that's not yes, but that's not to say that they didn't actually use the um flat top and the bullet helmet at the same time. That because you know, as you know, helmets are very expensive, especially back then when you had to hand forge them. So just because a new variant come out doesn't mean everyone has access to it. So some of your knights were still using the flat tops like the one on my profile picture, while others were had the new shiny bullet topped. The rounded, and the only reason was for that because they found out that some great swords, you know, they did a lot of damage coming down on top of those flat tops. But anyway, back to the kettle helm. This helmet was specifically designed um, to counteract the sunlight in um, soldiers' eyes. And for the archers, they occasionally had a nice little face mask that came down to the nose with two eye slits. So. When they were aiming, when they're drawing their bow, they could see just barely where their bow was aiming and still have the sun completely out of their eyes. And you know, so when you're holding, when they had the call to draw and they're holding there for at times 30 seconds or more, these are heavy bows. So if you're staring in the sun that whole time, that's going to suck. So these things not only had a huge visor like the M1917, the Brody helmet, blah, blah, blah. They not only had a huge visor to protect you from the sun, but also they had a nice little face mask they could flip down to, you know, counteract the sunlight too. It was also good in, in, um, on the foot soldiers who were ahead of the archers when they got into big melee battles. These little face masks actually did a lot to protect their faces because it's kind of very hard to direct a heavy sword in a single area. So if you're just going for the helmet, Chances are you're going to hit the top. Because it's very hard to make an accurate stab without getting stabbed yourself. I speak from experience. I am a fencer. But, yeah. So these, the kettle helms were actually a really effective design. And most people diss on them like, Oh, no, these are only archer helmets. No, shut up. They're not only archer helmets. They were actually widely used by foot soldiers and archers alike. So that's my little right. tangent about the kettle helm. Is there any kettle questions over. about that? Great. Yeah. No. So, Shadowversity did a very good uh, video on this just re recently, actually. Uh, well, it's posted to Shadowversity, but you guys test out the, the uh, <clears throat> I guess you could say the protection of each helmet. And one of the things they note about the kettle helm is that uh, when you someone goes to slash you with their weapon of choice, they would <laughs> soldiers would, would instinctively duck their heads, try to uh, anyone. Instinctively, when when someone goes to punch you or to hit you over the head, you duck your head, right? Kind of tuck your head to your shoulders, but you look down, right? Well, the kettle helm works kind of designed with that in mind as well, where it it created a much when they look down a much larger uh, surface. So they when they struck that, although it rang like a, t a uh, <clears throat> like a musical instrument in your a brass musical instrument in your ears. Uh, a tambourine or something like that. No. If way, you no. hear that ringing sound in your head, you're still alive. Correct. Yeah. And um, so it allows you to respond, and it's a, a decent, it's a decently good helmet. So the reason why I mentioned that, also the uh, the Brody, um, not the Brody, but um, the kettle helm was a very good helmet as well at that time because it made sense. Your elite front line, front line units had the more protective, heavier armor and heavier helmets, but the uh, but the the troops further back, or the troops defending a an, an area, having lighter armor and and these kettle helms, especially the poorer people, <clears throat> right, made sense because you these soldiers didn't necessarily need them as need all that protection because they'd be holed up inside the defensive fortifications, um, which obviously uh, there's a lot of people that would say, oh, that's bad because uh, because everyone needs all the heavy armor. Not really. No. No, give the peasant 50 pounds of armor. <laughs> it, it, it's like what... Uh, Go fight for your country, my brother. It, it's like what um, a certain 
a certain history, uh, YouTube historian put out in his firearms video saying that, oh, the U.S. wasn't all that, uh, the U.S. didn't supply all, everyone with M1 Garands or BAR. Some still had 1903s. And, but yeah, because not all of them were frontline infantry. You know? Not all so, of them were important infantry. Right. Yes. A lot so, of them were um, logistics and you know death clerks, headquarters battalion, artillery. So yes. Uh, going um, back to World War One now, the M1917, parallel to what Existence said about ducking your head, same thing applies to massive explosions. You generally flinch and duck your head. And these these nice little wide brims protected the shrapnel that would be entering your forehead area. And then also your uh, bayonet attacks as well. If, Indeed. Now, I, I said that previously that bayonets were, you'd, you'd stab forward like a spear, but not in World War One. They had blades that were more slicing, knives essentially. However, another reason why I said it is because a lot of times if you're being attacked, the, the the Germans in this case would be striking down at you either with their shovel, their bay, their bayonet, or their uh, in their hand or the bayonet on the end of their rifle. They'd be striking down into the trench. So that's where actually overhead protection would be very useful against bayonets. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, I think touch on some something you know uh, bullet protection and whatnot. Um, which it's not designed for, so of course it's not the best at that, which of course a grazing shot could of course bounce off. But anything more than that, and you'll probably get some the rest. Calibers increased and bullets began to be more, you know, more stopping power. It, you know, it, it becomes more difficult to stop nothing but a piece of like, rest steel. Mm-hmm. Yes. And especially since these things are, uh, one, one of the parts when Britain was making the original Brody helmet was that they needed to arm a ton of men extremely quickly. So the emphasis was not on making these things out of the greatest material ever. The, the material in the, the in a metallurgical stance is very poor initially and it never really improves because it doesn't need to be much more it just needs to be a firm metal that can is more likely to bend than break strong enough to cook out of yeah strong enough <laughs> to cook out of strong enough to beat it over someone's head uh, and strong enough to absorb uh, shrapnel from uh, certain uh, your enemy's artillery pieces where in, and that, that, that's another uh, something I'd like the 420 to millimeter cannons yeah direct fire it's meant to you know just negate the damage <laughs> uh, the first world war is one of the first wars where you are seeing an insane amount of artillery pieces of all calibers being used uh, from lighter um, what could basically be described as um, uh, prop like two inch guns from to stuff that's in the 400 millimeter shells are constantly Germany. flying <laughs> it, it, there, there are some images out of certain battles you will just see piles of ammo being used up daily. In the movie like, 1917, like, uh, when the two main characters are walking out of a German defensive position, you could see some destroyed artillery pieces, but there's shells, so many shells, shell casings everywhere. And right? that artillery, is, and that doesn't take long, especially for these new guns. They fire hundreds of millions of shells uh, monthly in, on just the uh, Western Front alone. 
the because the idea is the idea is if you use enough artillery, the enemy will die in their trenches, and then you can take their positions. Uh, with helmets, that that job became a whole hell of a lot harder. Yeah, to the Arti point. Or to the point where the artillery consumption just to get minimum casualties becomes extremely high. Partially due to while there is a lot of artillery and it is super dangerous, it is not accurate. Or not as accurate as it needs to be. Uh, yeah, but it's a lot better than what they had before this and because cannons before this, you have to understand, are they have almost no range of anything. They're uh, multi loaders, and also on top of that, they're more of a morale deter a morale drainer than anything because a bunch of big guns, a bunch of big booms fired at me. Uh, run because uh, although HE shells were used in that time, they weren't exactly common because they weren't exactly all that effective. <clears throat> um, and they're excellent shells. And they're very expensive, yes. But, um, and the reason why I say those artillery cannons didn't have range was because if you missed by a foot, nothing really changed. Honestly, maybe the, maybe make the guy stumble, but unless you hit him directly, not going to do much. World War I changed that. They had much greater range, varying calibers, and now they could do with, uh, with, uh, newer uh, high explosive specific rounds that were meant to shrapnel and to do everything just stated, it became much more deadlier. Yeah, the and you you could in like Civil War use a cannon to fire uh like over your own troops and into the enemy positions. And where to the point where you can't see them, you're just sitting in your position, you're just lobbing shells. You are not hitting anything, and at that yep. point, you're just wasting ammo. Um, mortars uh, are the closest thing that they had at this time, and they are really slow to move. They have uh, bad, terrible accuracy. Um, And are really only useful for firing itch at short, closer ranges, except for the very large mortars, into positions like, like uh, small forts or uh, entrenched enemies, not field yeah. battles. The uh, the artillery at this point didn't have much threats of counter battering, although that did happen sometimes. Your cannons were only in range to fire at the enemy position and out of range for the enemy's artillery. Because you don't want to take your artillery into their artillery. Right. But by the time you put your artillery into their artillery, artillery, you're pretty much close to the front lines and snipers are a bit of an issue. And, uh, you know, their artillery is shooting at you, their infantry is shooting at you. Uh, it's all in all not a good time. Yes. So that's why this exists, and that's why it's important, and it's very, it's a very nice helmet. For yes. her uh, first purpose, it would exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, the and the was, British used it all the way through the Second World War. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, America even used it for uh, majority. Of, the uh, nineteen uh, the nineteen thirties during the Depression. Yeah, it was even it was it even had a, a service in World War Two, uh, in the Philippines. Yes, uh, the uh, yes the Marines at in in the Philippines before it was taken and before U.S. standardization of the oh you could essentially I could I, I call it the the uh, U.S. relaunch where they do a whole revamp of their military weapons uniforms equipment and uh naming systems we'll get into that don't worry about that that's another brief yes but 
this helmet would also see service in a lot of other countries, even beyond the Second World War, um, who were really, really wanting new uh, equipment, but uh, did not want to buy brand new helmets, and were like, can we please get old stuff, please? We are poor. Literally hand-me-downs. Hand I think that's all I have on this helmet. I have nothing to add. I'm good here. Uh, Sideburn, do you have anything to add? I think we're good. We're good. Oh, uh, I I just remembered something. This is a very trippy helmet. Very trippy. Oh yes. It it is kind of stylish, as you can see from the picture in the very middle. Yeah, Yeah, he's very stylish. Look Look at that smile. Look at that Colgate smile. That man brushes every day. <laughs> and then, and then the, in the bottom right, that <laughs> the guy with that Brody helmet is like looking at the younger subordinate, like this this new generation. <laughs> they don't know what's good. They don't know the. Bro, back in my days, we had muddy trenches. Look at you and your armor support in your cast. <laughs> We we had a weather balloon and inaccurate artillery that sometimes hit on us. And then and then we <laughs> and, and, and then a uh, a two winged plane that could barely go above what uh nowadays stalling speed. You 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 young kids don't know anything. Anyways, so that's all we have. Uh, we'll move on to our final helmet for tonight. Oh. Maybe maybe. Maybe oh. we're taking actually a really good time. I think we've got time for it. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, do we? Does someone have a uh, stopwatch on it? Uh, stopwatch. What? What do you mean? Uh, I'm just. I'm just um, looking at my clock. Recording. Yeah, looking, who here is using like a normal like wind up clock? <laughs> I have one from 1913, actually. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, well, anyways, it's more accurate than the stupid technology. <laughs> Move. Moving on to the um, next helmet. All right, Team Adrian. So, um, fun thing about this helmet. Uh, due to the lack of a helmet at the beginning of World War One, um, it, it was it was born out of necessity because of the uh, loss of. Yeah, a couple guys due to shrapnel and whatnot, or just just random deaths and whatnot in in the in the battles and all that. A series of uh, unfortunate events. Yeah, it was in, as you can see the flag in the very center of the screen shows us it was a uh, a French designed helmet designed in mm-hmm. 1950, I believe, by a Virginized uh, uh, Yeah, some some uh, French guy. I think his name was Adrian. Yeah, you cut out. Uh, okay, so... Uh, uh, sideburns, you did cut out. Uh, I, I don't know if you're back. You're, Where did I leave off on? Uh, you were talking about the, why the helmet is named Adrian. Oh, yes. It was, uh, you know, it was a French helmet, of course, designed by August Louis Adrian. In 1950, I believe. Does that mean the designer of the uh, M1917, his name was 1917? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll so, see my. I'll see myself that, out. That was that was not the designer, um, because th- this wasn't an original design. This is this is a copyright. This is a copy of the Parisian. Uh, World War One uh, fire department helmets. But you you can see how closely it resembles both. I'd say the Pith helmet and the M nineteen seventeen in its design. Uh, kinda, but but it, it is literally their fire department's helmet. Yeah. Uh, the the the. Uh, the the Adrian Adrian is the general who ordered the helmet. I see. Uh, yeah. So, uh, France did actually have a solution to the problem. It just wasn't a good one. If I'm uh, not mistaken, uh, the French uh, doctrine behind this helmet specifically 
was that their fire department would wear these helmets, obviously, to protect their head against falling debris. And since artillery had become a, much, a lot, much, a lot more deadlier, raining shrapnel and debris down in your head, they figured these helmets would be perfect to protect a soldier's head from, you know, flying wood or rock and whatnot. Yeah, and they actually did a pretty good job. Oh yes, yes. But the French had a earlier design to their uh, helmet. Uh, they started the war with hat. Uh, I best to start this off with. There was this. There, there's this myth that goes around that the, the soldiers got helmets because it got to the point where the sh they were wearing pots and pans on their head to protect them from shrapnel, uh, which is maybe true. Maybe some private stuck his head with a pot on his head. But the French actually had a skull cap, a metal bowl specifically designed for their head to put under their hat. They're separate. They, they don't go in the hat. They just sit on the head and then you put the hat on. There's nothing holding it in place. It is just a metal skull cap. Um, because it was the simplest thing. The French troops would still look like French troops. They would still wear their hats, and now they're protected from fragmentation. Turns out, didn't work so well, uh, and they just went with a helmet. They, um, although I, I shouldn't say it didn't work, it just didn't work well enough for that to be the final solution that they decided on. What do you mean, an unsecured metal cap on someone's head? What could possibly go wrong? Well, I mean, it went under their hat, so at least they were fashionable. They had that French <laughs> trip. The, the, uh, yeah, the French going into World War One wearing the bright red and blue. Yeah, this can't go wrong. That's why they switched to the gr bluish gray uh, that is now seen, because the, the, the colors they were wearing are the blue and red from their flag, pretty much. Uh, so the bright red bullseye is the french soldier uh hans take him out yeah. now many now so you could ask why um this is even in this presentation this discussion because it's french helmet well what is it doing in a u.s helmet lineup because it's that's a, very, that's a very good question and we're changing it, because the, uh, <clears throat> changing the script up it's technically a U.S. service helmet because um, the American, uh, for those of you listening on audio, the 369th Night Infantry Regiment, also known as the Harlem Hellfighters, were issued French Adrians. So, yeah, it is an American service helmet. American soldiers did use this helmet uh, before the 1970s, before the actual army was uh, in Europe with the 1917. Well, the helmet existed. They th this wasn't issued until nineteen seventeen. Right. Right. The, uh, <clears throat> you're right. The, uh, the, the the earlier I stated that there were Americans who did actually use the Brody helmet. Uh, that is because uh they w needed a helmet quickly and um some surplus helmets were available from the British and the French. So I'm going to borrow those. Um, and since the unit in this case was a separate uh, black unit, the units were separated by race at that time. So it wasn't like they get the cruddy French helmet. It was just that unit got the French helmet. And they right. just all happen to look like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, fun, a, fun, a funny thing about that, Woodrow Wilson said that our country is divided racially. So, let's go ahead and send our boys to go fight overseas against another, against another country to unite them. Yes, let's kill our soldiers to unite them. Perfect. Yes, and we will not stick them in the same units. We will stick them in totally separate units. 
Yeah, uh, one thing I love about that is that France was having issues because the Battle of the Somme, I believe, is a great example of just the stuffy officers just being just retarded because they, the French soldiers, especially the French, took so many losses because they, the, the, the officers had a bit of a doctrine like Soviet uh, Order 223, I believe it's, it was, where it's not one step back, and they just pushed the soldiers in the machine gun fire constantly. It's, can we get some artillery? Can we get some support? Nope, just run into the machine gun. Just, just run in there and expect to do it. To the point where French soldiers in some sectors started rebelling and killed their officers, started officer fragging because of how many losses they were taking. France wasn't coming, wasn't recovering from that too well at, at, at the short amount of time they needed to. So they went to America and begged them for support. Wilson said, okay, because again, unite the, let's unite the boys by sending them off to war. And was perfectly fine with just putting a bunch of American soldiers under the command of French generals. The same ones who got so many French soldiers killed but uh, <clears throat> this can't backfire when we have three separate uh, nations worth of generals with intermingled units. This can't end poorly. Thankfully, oh, General uh, General uh, 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 Sideburns, you said something. I said, "What could go wrong?" Uh, um, nothing. Nothing. This is an excellent plan. Yeah, as if, as if the French office corps just didn't didn't just learn about what what could go wrong um uh, general pershing of uh, of the united states fortunately had the in, had the mental capacity that apparently the french generals didn't have um as laser pig would put it the france had a similar problem to britain in the officer corps uh laser pig put it <clears throat> the officer corps was stuff full of inbred rich posh layabouts so but in america it Kinda wasn't the same. It, it, they had more competent generals, and Pershing said, "No, that's bullcrap," and would change things up in order to, you know, oh, I don't know, a, a very new concept, save some soldiers' lives. No, that's ludicrous. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, that is. Uh, does anyone else have anything else to say on the Adrian? Uh, Not here. yes. Oh, uh. uh <coughs> Before you go first. Oh, no, I said not here. Oh, I thought you said here. No. Nah. Okay, well, then I will take the final stand. Huzzah! The... Standing here. No. I realize the copyrights are coming for me. No. But, Anyways, uh, the... This helmet gets a bad rap, and it honestly doesn't deserve it. Well, it's French, yeah. so there you go. Yeah, it's honestly French, so kind of like F tier, F tier on the tier list. Where we actually have a like tier list, uh, being uh, you know just like on my wall. It's just it's the the Adrian's just on the bottom. It, it's not even on the tier list. It's on just on the floor. It's in the trash can. No, it doesn't deserve to be in the trash can. It would defile the trash can. Ah. Uh, anyways, your point. No, this helmet was a fine helmet. Outside of the French generals being kind of stupid, and I know not kind of stupid, like really, really, really freaking stupid, this helmet is fine. The U.S. servicemen who used it, now, to my knowledge, didn't really complain about it. Um, well, there are things that are French, like that one French light machine gun that was known for the constant jamming. This thing. <clears throat> Is very simple. It is effective at its job. It's just not no. It, it gets a lot of hate, mostly just because it's French, and that's it. Kinda it's accurate. Kind I mean, of unfortunate because it's kind of fair because it's French. Yeah, well, yeah, it is. But there, there are good designs <clears throat> that some of them had. But a, lot of, a lot of these minor nations are major nations that do terribly and all of their equipment is just unilaterally labeled as garbage F tier. But in this right. case, I don't believe that that stands. It's made out of basically the same material as the, uh, 
uh, Brody helmet, uh, the M1917, and the Stahl, uh, uh, yeah, the Stahl helm. I don't, I, I think I, I, I confused myself there for a second. Um, but it was a decent helmet. However, it was not good enough for America it, to for America warrant America building a similar helmet, especially because it is quite literally a ripoff of the Parisian fire helmet. I probably should have added a picture of that, but I was kind of out of room. Uh, my PowerPoint skills are not maxed out. I'm only level ninety nine. So, um, anything else? I believe that is it. And we'll do the outro. Under the outro. Uh, thank you for watching. This has been U.S. Service Helmets Part 1. This has been the Dragoon Helmet up to the 1915 Adrian. Next time, we will be going over second, the Second World War to the modern day.